I just want to welcome everyone to our second quarterly care workshop. These workshops are designed to focus on the nuts and bolts of actual architectural preservation. This one is going to be on historic wood windows. Our expert, Michelle Brenner, is going to go over <coughs> identifying problems, troubleshooting, and why it's better to keep your windows. Michelle? All right. Hi everybody, um, like Brooke said, my name is Michelle Brenner. I specialize in wood window restoration. What I'm gonna be talking about um, is going to be specific for New Orleans and Southeastern Louisiana. So the products and things I talk about may not be the same for someone who lives in Alaska or Indiana or anywhere like that. Um, first, I wanna say I am very obsessed with wood window restoration. So I'm happy to see such a big crowd here that is willing to learn about it. And along with that, I'm gonna use my uh, cues here because I might go way overboard on different things that you guys are not interested in. Um, and first, I will say as well that I'm gonna repeat something that Mike said at his presentation about brick and mortar, if you guys were at that, that it's always okay to question your contractor. Get references from them, go visit jobs that they have done before because a lot of the work that I do is fixing work that was done incorrectly. So it's totally fine. If somebody is not okay with you questioning their work, you probably don't want to hire them for the job. Um, and also to get permits. Um, I know that's a big thing. Make sure the contractor gets permits. It's something that saves you. If you're just getting one pane of glass replaced, you should get an HDLC permit for that certificate of appropriateness. You don't need to pay safety and permits for that you just go down to the building or your contractor goes down to the building and gets that. Um, and at the end, I'll ask if anybody has specific questions as well. So first and foremost, there are multiple types of windows. So here we have a triple hung window. So we have three sashes. The sash is your movable part. So this piece that has six panes in it is one sash. Most of you probably have a double hung sash in your house. So you just have one that has two of these in it, not three. It's <coughs> not very typical to have a triple hung window in your home, but it does happen. Um, you also have a casement window and a casement window is hung very much like a door where it's hinged. So you open it inward and outward. And then you have your tilt windows, <coughs> such as a transom, what you would find above your door that will tilt down and up. So those are your different types, your most common types of wood windows. Um, for parts, that's something that I feel like a lot of people don't know about is the actual names of your parts of your building. So on the back of your handouts there, on the front, we have my information and some good resources that you can check out if you have questions. On the back, there is a diagram of what we call the anatomy of a window. So it's a good reference if your contractor or someone is talking to you and they're like, oh, well, your mutton is broken and needs to be replaced. And you're like, I have no idea what a mutton is. You can look at that or you can call me and ask me. Um, so like we said, we have our sash here and that is made up of your rails and styles and your mutton. Um, and then you have your glass, of course. Um, and then you have your jam, and that's what creates the track that makes the window sashes go up and down. And within your track, you have different pieces of trim that create the track. Then the most important part of your window is your glazing putty, which you're not gonna be able to see, but is down in here, it's a beveled edge, and you can kind of see it peeking through behind some of um, the muttons right there. Your glazing putty is your most important part of your window. So first I'll say your window is made to come apart and be fixed. Unlike a new wood window or a vinyl window, it is made to be taken apart and put back together. With all wood pieces, there shouldn't be any metal in there. So if you get a small piece of rot in your window here, this whole piece can be just taken off and replaced with a new piece. If you have this piece needs to be replaced, it can just be replaced. That's something that a lot of people think, oh, I have rot in my window, the whole thing has to go. Um, and 
a lot of people worry about energy efficiency with that. And everyone says it's not sustainable to replace a wood window with a vinyl window because your wood windows then end up in a landfill when they're made to be replaced. I mean, sorry, when they're made to be repaired, not replaced. Um, so let me check my. So also with energy efficiency, there's a lot of new, um, new things that you can do with windows to make them more energy efficient. That's one thing we hear all the time. People call and say, can you make my window more energy efficient? Windows really only lose 10% of your air from your home through them. So you're not losing a lot of it. It's mostly through your, um, your floor, your walls, and your roof that you're losing a lot of your air. But you can make your windows more energy efficient. You can weather strip them, you can take them out. There's bronze weather stripping, there's silicone weather stripping. Or you can replace the glass with a tinted glass or a laminated or tempered glass. When they say a double paned glass, usually it has gas in it. That's something you cannot do to <coughs> these windows. But a tempered or laminated pane of glass, you can put in them. You ha it's very expensive to do that and it doesn't save you that much money on your energy savings. They say it takes about 20 years to gain about $20 back from your energy <laughs> savings. So it's not usually worth it to go and pay $100 a pane, it can be, um, to save $20 after 20 years. With that being said, the one thing you can do to fix your glazing is, or sorry, to fix your, um, if you're losing a lot of energy through your windows, is to make sure your glazing is done well. So most people, if they don't know what they're doing with glazing, they use a subpar product or they use caulk, which also is a subpar product. Or I just recently bought a house in Holy Cross and moved in and there was no glazing in any of my windows. There were just a couple of the glazing pins in them. Um, so if you're losing energy through your windows, it's gonna be around the glass. So the glazing, you actually take the piece of glass out you put glazing putty around it, set the glass in, and you um, do a beveled edge around. And I actually have some of the glazing putty. You can buy this at Home Depot. Um, if your contractor is using this, this is great. There are some other ones that sell at Home Depot that are okay, but this is the closest you will get to original glazing putty. So what you would get, it, um, it is kind of heavy because it's full of water. Um, it's the closest you'll get to original glazing putty. So it's mostly linseed oil. There are a couple other ones. There's one called Sarco Glaze. That's also very good. You have to order it and usually you don't go through it fast enough and it will go bad. So this, this is $10 at Home Depot, so it's easy to use. Um, <laughs> the amount over here. Um, and so making sure your glazing is good. I actually just finished a job this morning where all of the panes of glass were caulked in. To remove the caulk, you have to break most of the glass because it's almost impossible to get the historic glass out without breaking it with caulk because the heat guns don't work on it. The caulk remover doesn't really work on it. So you're losing all of your nice glass, which they have, they have a couple panes up here of still nice historic glass and you can get replacement historic glass as well now it's getting cheaper like i was saying about the laminated and tempered glass as um, science and everything gets better it's getting less and less expensive to do that you used to not be able to because the panes were too thick to fit in this but now they're getting thinner and thinner as time goes on and science um, gets a little bit better so like I was saying, you can weather strip them to make them a little bit better. You can refit them, which just means a lot of times if your house has sagged a little bit, it's New Orleans, your house moves, your window's not necessarily going to move the same way with it. So you can get a carpenter to come in and he might add a little bit of wood somewhere to um, fill in a gap that you might have, or he might re-square the window to fit your jam, which is this frame again. 
so that it fits a little bit better and a little more snug. Um, and then lastly, the glazing putty, like I was saying, it's very, very important to the operation of the window. If you start seeing dirt or water droplets on your muttons, that's an indication that the water is actually coming through your glazing putty, which is a very, very common issue, which I'll touch on again later. Um, but typically people just think, oh, my windows are dirty, they're getting dust on them. Usually it's water coming through. I mean, obviously there's always gonna be some dust and dirt collecting, but if you're getting a good amount and water droplets there, usually you have water coming through your glazing. Uh, so to jump into some common issues with glazing, I'm glad, well, I guess it's gone away now when it was raining, we had some condensation on the window in here. That's a big problem in New Orleans. You have cold air inside and hot air outside, which makes condensation happen on your windows. It runs down, it sits on your glazing, and it molds. And it molds typically if you have the old glazing, linseed oil-based glazing molds very easily. It grows mold. So we have found adding zinc oxide, which is just a powder, to our glazing is very helpful. This is something you'll find in sunscreen. Yeah. Um, if you mix this in with your glazing putty um, before you put it on, <laughs> it is very helpful. We have not, this is something that the company that I used to work for, we struggled with. I know many other companies have struggled with this in Louisiana. They would want to use the best products and they would use Mildeside in their paint and it would still mold. And people would call back and be like, oh, my windows are molded again. What do I do? And so talking to the window preservation community, we found that zinc oxide is something that is very helpful with the glazing. We have not had a problem since. Um, and I was working in Virginia prior to this, so it's something I didn't really ever encounter until moving to New Orleans. Um, and How much? I mean, yeah. for that bag, it was about $10. No, I mean, how much? Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, I, so if I have a handful of glazing putty, I usually just do, I would say a tablespoon of um, zinc oxide in about a handful of glazing putty. Um, I have used anywhere from a little bit to too much sometimes if I, my hands are wet and I don't want to put them into the bag and I accidentally dump too much. Um, but either way, I've not had any issues, but I usually would say about a tablespoon. And zinc oxide is toxic, isn't it? I'm sorry? Zinc is, oxide is toxic. It can be. I, I know that... It is. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's yeah, not if you're... I think it's only if you're ingesting. Um, so some other problems that we, so that's glazing and reglazing. Um, reglazing is important in doing it correctly and making that bond around the glass. Yes. Michelle, I don't understand what the difference is between glazing and, and, and caulking. What, what does glazing look like? I have no knowledge. Of so that. if you want, we can open up that container that just got passed around of the glazing putty. Um, but it looks a lot like Play-Doh, like a tan Play-Doh. So you just use that instead of caulking? Yes. Oh, so, okay. I understand yes. that. Caulk understand is that. actually really bad for the wood, the material. Oh, I didn't see Okay, that. I understand. Um, it's just a difference in product. Yes. Okay. And you don't use it in a gun like you would a caulk. Yeah. It's something that you actually, I do a lot like Play-Doh, where yeah, you, you have to yeah. warm it in your hand, mm -hmm. and you put it on, and then you would actually most people, some people have different preferences, but you use a um, glazing knife like this. And this side is meant to cut the bevel that shows. It's different on this side of the window than it is on the outside, but you would basically pull your line just like that. It is something you have to practice. Okay. It, <laughs> it's, it is an art um, to be able to do it well, but I, everybody is capable of doing it. I've trained many many people to do it and it's people pick it up after a while they get aggravated with it a lot but it is something that um I, anybody can do thanks i understand okay yeah and the other side of this just in case anyone's wondering is usually used for if you're doing an upper part of a window or to um set the pins which while we're talking about glazing um i will say i have some pins for coming on you 
you pass those. These are what you use to hold the glass in. So before you do your beveled edge of glazing, you use the pins to hold the glass in. The glazing is enough to hold it in, but if you want to secure the glass really well, you should put the glazing pins in. And there are different kinds. They actually make a little glazing gun that you can use. Um, if you're not used to it, you break a lot of glass with it because it's like a staple gun almost um, when you put it in and you can break the glass pretty easily, but it makes it go a lot faster if you're used to it. I also have a glass cutting tool here, which is something that um, is easy and everybody can do it if you want to try. Um, if you have a little, a little bit of glass that you need to trim down. Another issue um, that we see a lot is the window sill itself, which here is a little bit different because we're going out onto a balcony, but you can imagine the bottom of the window. The sill should be tilted out towards the exterior of the house at least five to seven degrees. You can use a, um, a level. I have a small level here um, that I use and usually I just know about where my little bubble should be to show me if it's tilted enough. A lot of times people say, my windows are leaking, my windows are leaking, all the water is coming in underneath the window and it's because your sill is flat, water is sitting on it and it's finding a crack to go through and it's coming in under your window. So we just usually tilt the sill back up a little bit um, and fix it and trim the window. With that being said, if you have water coming in around your window, a lot of people don't realize sometimes with the way New Orleans houses are constructed, that's the first opening in your wall. So you might have a leak in your roof 10 feet away and it's gonna travel down and that's the opening that it's gonna find to come out. Mm. Um, your siding, a big thing that I'll mention is you should never caulk the lap joint of your siding so underneath, if you have wood siding, not caulking, especially if it's hardy board, if you read the hardy board warranty, it actually voids the warranty if you caulk the underneath of your siding. It traps the water in it and it's gonna find a way to come out. It's gonna come out around your windows typically or in your drywall. So we go out a lot of times with people thinking their windows are leaking and we actually have to tell them, actually you have to call your roofer, your chimney's not flashed correctly or something else is wrong <laughs> with your house. Um, because it just finds its way around the windows. Um, so again, the sill tilt is one of the big things that's just sitting on the window sill itself. So look for if it's raining and you have water coming in on your walls, look for where it pools up when it's actually raining. Another, um, let's say broken glass is a big thing that goes along with glazing. It's very easy to fix. If you find somebody that can glaze well, it, should take an hour to fix one broken pane of like one broken pane of glass. It's a very simple fix. You don't need to throw away your whole window. We've had people put in vinyl windows because they couldn't find anybody to fix one pane of glass. So please don't do that. Um, and then lastly, rot and replacement wood. So usually the bottoms of your windows are where you're going to see a lot of rot. That bottom rail, which is this down here. And a lot of times that is because of the sill and so there's water sitting and it's soaking it up. But sometimes it's just the water sitting on the glazing incorrectly or on the mutton incorrectly and it's gonna rot. Like I said, you can replace the whole piece, but if you have a small area of rot for whatever reason, maybe a nail got put in because someone hung curtains wrong and the, the metal um, helped with the wood rot because metal and wood is not a good combination. I like to use a product called Abitron, and this is something you can get at Liberty Lumber on Chapa Tulis. It's a two-part system. You can come take it, yeah. <laughs> and it is like a wood putty, but it is a little bit stronger and a little bit better for your wood. So you mix equal parts of the hardener and the consolidant together. Um, and you fill in your wood. I would not recommend using it for large pieces. Usually, personally, if it's over an inch and an inch, I don't use it, I replace it with wood. Um, even if I just have to cut it out and replace with a small piece of wood. 
I usually use it for small repairs, but some people do. If you go on their website, you will see a lot of people use it for larger repairs to windows and rot. It also comes with a liquid partner to that. And if you cannot get all of the rot out, then you're supposed to use the liquid first and it kind of seals the rot. You drill a couple holes, you fill the wood with the liquid, and then you put the epoxy on top of that. Um, Bondo is what a lot of people use here. I would not recommend Bondo. It actually helps your wood rot more and more. It's typically made for car repairs, not for window repairs. Um, so if you can, the, I will say the one problem with Abitron is it is expensive. Um, so it's not, and it's not as easily accessible as Bondo, but even your normal wood filler is better like a Minwax wood filler from Home Depot is better than Bondo would be. Um, okay, so those are some of your common issues. Again, if you have questions in the end, if you have a specific question or issue, we'll bring that up. Um, and then lastly, I just wanna go over kind of the process of what I would do if I were restoring a window. We call it a full restoration. So to take out the window, typically you would have an interior stop. In here, it's a very large interior stop, but this piece of trim right here would come off. You do not have to take apart the whole jam. Um, most of you probably have a little trim piece in your house. You may not even know that it's separate from your casing and your interior trim, but it is. You take that off and then you're able to use, most of the time you can just take one off if you don't need to do any repairs to them and you can just slide your sash out. So you would have your lower sash and that is connected by your sash cord, which is connected to your weight. And it, when you lift your window up, if you're able to, this jam has been redone, so it doesn't have it, but if your jam has not been redone, you would have what we call a weight pocket. So it's a little access door that you can get to your weights. You open that up, usually it's just held in by a nail or a screw and you can access your weights, cut your rope. Um, I recommend if you're cutting from there that you tie a knot in it or else your, uh, your weight might fall. <laughs> if you have a balloon frame house, you might not get that weight back. <laughs> so tie a knot in the rope. Um, and while we're talking about rope, I will say someone asked, um, the only place in New Orleans you can buy the rope that I recommend is uh, Carruth Brothers Lumber. It's C-A-R-R-U-T-H. This one is called Samson um, Spot Cord Number Eight, and it has a nylon cord. So if you go to any hardware store here, you will be able to get sash cord. It's just going to be this kind of sash cord that I would not recommend. If you actually use your windows, that will break fairly quickly. Um, it is just cotton. It wears down just like a t-shirt would after wearing it. Another issue with sash cord is most people actually paint it. If you have painters come through your house, painters just want to paint your sash cord that's going to make it break down even more so getting the one with the nylon core is if you're using your windows a lot is really helpful they'll last a long time we take out windows that have um the samson sash cord the same kind of sash cord that has been in there at least 50 years um we've found all sorts of things attached to them in the bottom um people make their own kind of weights that tell us <laughs> how old it actually is um or gives an idea of how old it actually is so that is your sash cord it's pretty easy um to replace them it really just depends on your weight and if it's usable you tie a knot in it and you rehang it and there's a little spot in your sash on the side to attach your sash cord sometimes you just have to put a knot in it sometimes it's easier to put a screw through the knot as well um, next we would do is we would deglaze the sash. So we're taking out all the glazing. We use scrapers. And so my favorite little <coughs> scraper is this triangle blade scraper. And then we also have a five in one, um, which is just a multi-use tool. It's helpful in a lot of things to get the glass out. If you have um, really old, do you want to pass this? Sure. Um, if you have really old glazing, it's hard to get out and you can use heat, like a heat gun. If you do that, you wanna put a piece of cardboard that's wrapped in aluminum foil up against the glass because the heat will break the glass. So you kinda wanna just prop it up 
while you're using the heat. Um, or you, if you really are into redoing your windows, you can make a steam box to put them in. But that's something that usually is a lot of work and I feel like most homeowners probably will not do. But um, also like a steamer like you would use on your clothes will not break the glass as easily and you can use to remove the paint and the glazing. So once you've scraped all the paint and glazing out, you sand it down, you re or you repaint. Um, and I recommend an oil primer if you're getting all of the paint off. If you're not getting all of the paint off, you wanna use a latex primer. And that's because if you have a um, oil paint, it's very stiff and latex moves. So if you put latex under oil, it's gonna move and that oil is just gonna break apart. So if you have still some um, paint on your windows and you're not sure what kind it is, I just recommend using a latex primer, but if you can, oil will last longer. Then you finish it off. We've talked about glazing, so you put your glass back in and you rehang your sash <coughs> um, on our cord and on our weights. Um, and then really it's a lot about hardware, which I will say, I'm gonna rag on, I don't like the sash cord and I don't like that these windows don't have hardware because it keeps them, they're gonna rattle if the wind is strong enough. So if you have some good hardware in the right spot, it will hold them together a little bit better and just form a really good window unit. I think that it might be the end of my spiel. So we can start with questions if anybody has one. Yes. How do you handle uh, ultraviolet light on historic windows? So you can do films. I've done films. I've also done um, different types of glass, tinted glass as well. And again, they make it thin enough now that you can put it in. That's a very recent development. It used to be too thick. Even four years ago, it was too thick to be able to put in tinted glass. We would just have to put a film on it um, to help with sunlight and everything a lot of people have it you know have the issue in their bedrooms and things they're it's really hot all the time and they don't always want to have their blinds closed so they also make tinted historic glass now which is kind of cool so you can get the nice wavy glass look with a tint in it does that answer your question enough yes it does okay. i have one other question okay uh give me your uh, ideas on trains versus sports so chains came later. Typically, um, if your window is from about the 1930s to 1940s is when you would have a chain on your window. If you have the right pulley for a chain, which the pulley is what's up there on the roller, if you have the right pulley for a chain, they're not very much different. If you have the incorrect pulley or the incorrect weighted chain, the chain will knot up a lot faster than the sash cord will. Um, so it's just about making sure that they're partnered well together. The right weight chain is very important. John, did you have a question? The film, uh, you know, it, uh, against light, is it safe to put on the old glass? It is. Um, I will say taking it off is what is the pain. Um, we recently did that in Audubon Park. Um, it smells really bad, but it's also just you have to scrape a lot and with the glass being fragile but if you put it on and you get somebody who's a professional at tinting put it on and you want to leave it there it's going to be fine to put it on it's really just the taking it off that can be we had no glass break i will say taking it off it was just painstaking to be very careful taking it off yes we have mid 19th century double long 606 mm -hmm. they don't leak okay really Unless wind-driven rain is being driven directly at the window. Mm -hmm. In which case, we have one hell of a problem coming in between the two windows. Okay. Up there. Yep. And through the sill. Okay. So there's nothing you can do about that? There is and there's not. Um, weather stripping. So the company that I used to work for, um, which is one of the things, one of the places listed on the helpful links at Stop Window Restorations, they and Bill Robinson also do a silicone weather stripping. And so it's just a bead. It's a hollow bead of silicone weather stripping that they place. So they cut a channel into the sash 
and they do one channel up between the meeting rails and stick it in and then one at the bottom they can do it on the sides as well attach it to what? and you actually so you would actually just cut a channel with a router into the sash itself and slide it in um and that has helped a lot with people having water issues but other than that there's not much you can do other than, like I said, if your hardware isn't keeping them as tight together in the middle or if your sill isn't slanted. Otherwise, it's just the rain and it's just coming at a weird angle. Yes? My house is stucco on one side and or a couple of sides and brick on one side. How should windows, or should they, be sealed on the exterior? So one recommendation I always, or one thing I always say is, you caulk at the top, you never caulk at the bottom. So if your windows, I'm assuming they probably have the wood exterior casing around them, they're probably caulked and painted. Never to caulk under your windowsill, never to caulk under your casing or even your trim pieces. So like this piece or this piece where it meets the bottom at the sill to leave that open so water has a place to get out. And again, that's a New Orleans, Louisiana thing because water is going to come in no matter what and it's going to get trapped so making sure it has a way to get out is key so it looks pretty and nice to caulk everywhere but then you're going to trap the water in so no matter if you have brick or anything caulk is fine as long as you leave a place at the bottom for it to so get out what if it already has caulk at the bottom should that be removed yes yeah you can cut that out <laughs> And that's what I, again, would say with the siding, it's a big issue is everybody caulking the joints of their siding underneath. The, the um, vertical joints are fine, but the horizontal joints, having someone even just rip out the caulk in every couple of them um, is is better than leaving it as So you would take out the caulk on the sides? No, keep the caulk on the sides, just at the bottom. Just take the caulk out at the bottom. All right, I think our time is up, but I will hang around for a couple minutes if anybody has any questions. All right, thank you guys very much.